Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Most of us probably know someone who's sitting on the fence with the Lord. They're not sure if they're really ready to come fully over to the place of full obedience. Well, this was the case with many people in the days of Moses. And today in our study of Exodus chapter 7, we're going to see what God does for these people and really for all of us to convince us of the worth and value of fully trusting and obeying Him. So welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. I am Russ Brewer, and it is an honor to go through God's Word with you. Now, you've probably noticed that this book we're reading is called Exodus, and the word Exodus has this idea of exit or departure. And this section of the book of Exodus is about how God brings about deliverance of the Jews from Egypt through the ten plagues so that they could worship him ultimately as his chosen people and establish this nation of people through whom he will bring about the Savior to the world. And so over the next several days, we're going to be looking at God bringing about this exodus through the ten plagues. And as we begin this study, we are entering a section of Scripture that gives meaning to the phrase biblical proportions. And here we're going to be seeing what these categories look like. And so I'd like to touch upon a concept that I think bears mentioning as we look over the next several chapters. Again, we're going to be reading about the ten plagues. These are miracles of biblical proportions. And I recognize, though, that this material might be troubling to some of our modern sensibilities. In fact, there'll be times, like in today's passage, where the Egyptians seem to do the same miracles that Moses is doing. And this is just going to bug us, and we're going to be wondering, maybe all these are just magic tricks and are not real. We need to keep in mind that these next few chapters are excellent examples of what spiritual warfare looks like. And what I mean is this. When Satan works, his deeds produce confusion among those who lack discernment. For those who are just looking for reasons to reject God, Satan's work will give them ample reasons to reject him. For those who are just not really even wanting to understand what God is really about, Satan's work will provide enough counterfeits that are difficult to discern what is the actual source of these events. And so we're going to see these spiritual realities unfold in the next few chapters as we look at this spiritual warfare that's going on here. Now we might wonder, well, why does God allow this? Why isn't he more clear? Why does he allow for this confusion? Well, that's in part because God's not really worried about placating the questions of people who are just looking for reasons to reject him. He's not really worrying about confusing people who don't care enough about him to actually put in the spiritual effort into discerning what is truly of him. And so the people whom he has given eyes to see and ears to hear will see what he is doing and believe in him and trust him. And ultimately, that's what God's concerned about, giving his people the truths they need to know to know him and walk with him to become his people. Now, another point that we're going to see unfold over the next couple of chapters is that God is actually fulfilling his promise from Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, that he would deliver the Jews in a manner that the Jews would know that he was the Lord their God. And so Exodus chapter 6, verse 7 says, Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so the next few chapters show us what God did to produce this deliverance. These miracles that we're going to be reading about are set against the so-called gods, the little g-gods of the Egyptians. And each miracle left the Jews having to ask this question, am I going to follow the Egyptian God or the God, the Lord, who just defeated it? And so this is a real spiritual battle. And although the next few chapters are kind of tough reading for our modern sensibilities, in many ways they're intended to be. They require all of us to think about what's being said and to put a stake in the ground and declare, this is what I believe. I believe these are true and I'm willing to rearrange my life around these truths like the Jews did. Now, many people will read these passages and walk away like Pharaoh. They'll have a hardened heart. They'll walk away unchanged. I would caution these people. Those of us who believe these passages aren't some kind of simple-minded, easily duped kind of people. We too have wrestled with these passages ourselves, and we've come away finding that they point us to the truth about our Lord. Now, some people will read these passages and still have questions left over. I would encourage those people to trust God and recognize that there are mysteries that we will not fully understand until we are with the Lord in glory. And so with that as some background, now let's forge John in this chapter and begin mining out these great riches in the book of Exodus as we begin chapter 7. Okay, well, actually, real quick. For the past few chapters or past few days, we've been reading about how God protected and preserved Moses and then called him to lead the people out of Egypt. We had to skip over chapters 5 and 6. But in Exodus chapter 5, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and ask him to let the Jews go and worship the Lord. Pharaoh responds in Exodus chapter 5 verse 2 saying, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. And then as the passage unfolds, we find out that Pharaoh puts even greater manufacturing burdens upon the Jews, and the people cry out to Moses down in chapter 5 verse 21 saying, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight. And so 
Pharaoh is angry at Moses and the people are angry at Moses. And this is not an auspicious beginning. And this is exactly what Moses was concerned about. And so in verse 22, which is the last verse of chapter 5, Moses goes to the Lord and basically says, God, this is not going well. Why did you send me? And the Lord's answer starts in chapter 6, verse 1, where the Lord reiterates all of his promises to Moses that he, the Lord, is going to be with Moses and go before him and everything's going to go according to plan. And that then brings us to chapter 7, where we are now going to see the beginning of the 10 plagues in verses 1 and 2 and the beginning of God's deliverance of his people. And so in chapter 7, the Lord calls Moses to go back to Pharaoh despite the friction of their last meeting. And in verses 3 to 5, the Lord promises to harden Pharaoh's heart. (laughs) Not super encouraging, but then again, the Lord told Moses this also back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, that the Lord would do all kinds of incredible wonders through Moses, though the net result would not be to soften Pharaoh's heart. And so we shouldn't be surprised that Pharaoh doesn't want to let the Jews go. Now, as we go on to verse 7 here, we're reminded that Moses isn't a young whippersnapper. It says that Moses was 80 years old, Aaron was 83, Moses is the kid brother to Aaron. And so together, these two youthful dudes go over to Pharaoh. And sure enough, when Moses goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's not cool with what Moses is suggesting. And so in verse 10, Aaron throws down his staff and lo and behold, it becomes a serpent. Now, that's a great start. But then when you read verse 11, Pharaoh calls in his wise men and his sorcerers, and they do the same thing. They throw down their staffs, and they become serpents too. Now, this might cause us to ask, what gives? I was barely okay with Moses doing this incredible miracle of throwing a stick down and becoming a snake. Now these magicians are doing this? Well, this gets to the crux of the spiritual warfare that I was talking about a few moments ago. When Satan works, he will bring in counterfeits and confusion. And so these sorcerers are using what I believe is a sleight of hand to bring some charmed snakes into this scene and throw them down in a way that makes them look like they're sticks turning into snakes. And the idea is that if these magicians can do something similar to what Moses is doing, well then obviously Moses' miracle is not real and therefore we don't have to pay attention to his Lord, his God. And so Satan is working to give Pharaoh and the sorcerers all these reasons not to deal with the truth of what Moses is saying. The thing is, Moses is not a magician. He's a shepherd, and he's not some young, nimble-handed guy who can do sleight of hand. He's an 80-year-old guy, and he and Aaron have just taken an actual stick, and God has turned it into an actual snake. The first time that God did this was with Moses back in chapter 4, verse 3, and Moses was so wigged out by the snake, he ran from it. Later on, this very same stick or staff gets put into the ark. It's, it's just a stick that God is miraculously right here turning into a snake. And not only that, in this miracle here, in a show of God's power, Aaron's staff, which is now this snake, eats up all the other snakes, which would have also been a miracle because that's a lot of food. And so the point of this passage is God is doing real miracles through Moses and the sorcerers are doing side tricks, but Pharaoh is hard-hearted and he can't see the difference. The next section has a similar dynamic. Here we're coming up to our first plague starting in verse 14. Each of these 10 plagues was God toppling the false gods of the Egyptians. And so the first god that the Lord is going to take on here is the gods of the Nile. One of these so-called gods was the god Hopi. And Hopi was the god of the Nile and the god of fertility. And in a moment, rather than producing life, the Nile is going to be producing death. Kunum, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, but K-H-N-U-M was the god over the source of the Nile. And Osiris was said to have had the Nile in his bloodstream. And so this event shows us that all of these gods are false and that the Lord is the one true god. And so in verse 20, Moses and Aaron go down to where Pharaoh is bathing and turns the Nile to blood. So no more fun swimming anymore. And this isn't fake blood. This isn't where there's just like some kind of red food coloring in the water. This is real blood. And as we read in this passage here, we find out it's not just the Nile. It's every place where there's water. But again, in verse 22, the magicians are able to do some kind of sleight of hand where they seem to do the same kind of thing. But it's interesting here because if they could actually do what Moses is actually doing, they would have been able to turn the Nile back to normal clean water, but they can't. And so they have to spend seven days without clean water having to dig wells. But still, even with all of this, Pharaoh was determined to refuse to listen to Moses and Aaron. And just like an ancient prima donna in verse 23, Pharaoh just kind of turns and goes back to his own house, not even caring about this, maybe just sulking or just trying to figure out what's going on. Now, this is one of those private moments that can have a huge impact on whether or not a person believes in Christ, comes to Christ, and deepens their fellowship and walk with him. With each of these plagues, Pharaoh has the opportunity to humble himself and recognize that Moses is serving a real God and that he, Pharaoh, needs to take heed to who this God is and let God's people go to worship him. Instead, Pharaoh's like, my guys can do that just as good if not better. And a lot of times we do that today. In our world, we watch so many movies with all kinds of fantasy. We're just like, you know what? The Bible's okay, but I kind of like my movie better. 
what we're failing to recognize is that these are real works that we're reading about here. These were really done by God. And what we see in movies or what we see magicians do, that's just fake fantasy. And Pharaoh here is allowing fake fantasy to keep him from actually reckoning and believing in the true God of creation. Now, of course, Moses and Aaron aren't done, and they're going to continue to prove that they are the real deal, bringing the real message of God to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. And yet Pharaoh and these sorcerers are going to have this hardened heart. Now, as we think about this passage, what does this passage tell us for today? Well, for one thing, this passage is telling us that God works, that God who created everything does at times engage with creation at an atomic level, at a molecular level, and, and at times he works in a way that transcends the laws of nature that he has established. We're going to see that he's going to do more of this tomorrow, and our job is to let these realities rest on our soul. Here he's calling these Jewish people to recognize who he is, to not be entangled with the Egyptian religion, to come out of Egypt and be gathered as his people to worship him and to know him. And he's calling us as well into his kingdom to gather to know him, to worship him, to be rightly aligned with him. And when we're rightly aligned with him, we will know him and believe him and worship him. Now, a lot of times we want God to do miracles like this in our life. We're like, if God would just do something like this, then I'd believe. But we're going to see that Pharaoh and Pharaoh's sorcerers and all these people who saw these miracles still didn't believe. And so the issue isn't, well, if God would just do this in my life, then I'll believe. The issue is us coming before him, coming before his word, and letting his word, his truth, rest on our souls through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we would know him rightly. We serve a God who is involved in our lives. Maybe not with the biblical proportions that we see here, but he does work in our life. The question is, are we like Pharaoh and the Egyptians who are hardened to his work and who won't believe it even when we see it? Or are we like Moses and the people of God who, when he works, we praise him and celebrate him? Well, that wraps up our study in Exodus chapter 7. I look forward to going through the next few chapters with you as we continue to look at how God delivers his people. And so I hope you have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless.